We have a couple of scriptures there this morning that I ask you to give your attention to. I'm going to, the Luke scripture will be throughout the, the, the message, it's there anyway, but I want to share this morning the, uh, the message from Hebrews, from the epistle, Hebrews um, chapter 10 and verses 5 through 10, if you'd like to follow along. Um, Uh, talking about Christ's sacrifice uh, once and for all. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings, and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. And then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first established, the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Amen. He's quoting Psalm 40 in there, um, the writer of Hebrews, and you're going to hear a little more about that, and I think it's an important message. Um, this message kind of came out of a conversation earlier this week, and uh, first there was some discussion going on when we were wrapping caramels downstairs um, about decorating the memorial garden, how we had it out there and we needed to use it and decorate it, we needed to put a big tree in the middle and have a tree lighting ceremony and all this stuff. Last week, we were talking about this, weren't we? And um, then it was Lowell Johnson and Josh and Miles that were talking about having this lighting ceremony. And it's a, it's a great idea, but it's kind of last minute to try to do this year. And the other thing was the tree was going to be the one that's outside the south door that was going to be cut down and moved and raised in the garden. So yes. um, they just trying to put a little joy into my Christmas season by all this uh, plotting and planning. What do you think, preacher? They knew what I thought. <laughs> and it is a great idea. We need to do something like that. So later in the week, um, Ken and Irma Flores stopped by the office, and Irma was telling me how someone had suggested to her that we decorate the garden. Um, and that started a conversation between Joan and Irma and I about the decorations. And, and I'll, I said, well, there's probably not time, but why don't we just put one of those great big Santas in his sled with the reindeer in their heads and his hand moving, one of those robotic Santas um, out there in the garden. And that led to me talking about an article I just read about um, living nativities, they call them. And they're actually robotic nativities that you'll hear a little more about as we talk today. But, um, so we got talking about the decorations and then we turned toward how Christmas has become so artificial and so far from what it really represents. And then I made the mistake of saying, well, there's my sermon for this week. And you know what? I'll call it Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing. And then Herman and Joan laughingly said, no, call it Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing Baby. <laughs> that was a song that was by, you may remember, by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing Baby. And it was at that point that these two brainstorming Christian women decided that, yes, that in fact needs to be the sermon. In fact, I think I heard one of them say, I dare you. <laughs> Yeah. So, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. I mentioned it to Nate, and he said it should be, ain't nothing like the real baby thing. Which should work too. But so today we are talking about there ain't nothing like the real thing. Um, and as I thought further about this, and I started to look into this message, um, there really was some amazing truths that were revealed in that in that 
um, conversation that we had because you know, in all the commercialism and imaginations, there really is nothing. We look at all these decorations and all these big things and all that goes on, but there's really nothing like the real thing. And it's ironic that the Christmas story so often gets lost in our Christmas celebrations. Um, it's, such a, it's such a beautiful story. And the drama is just so overpowering. I'm trying to tone it down here a little bit, but just think about it. A young married girl is about to give birth to a child who is destined to lead his people to freedom. A man, here we have in this story, so in love with his fiance and so confident in God's faithfulness that he defies all the social customs and he marries her anyway. There's a band of mystics who spend years following a star that they believe is going to lead them to a new king. A greedy, insecure ruler commits murderous atrocities in a village in order to protect his throne. And then a group of teenage boys are working the night shift and they witness an extraterrestrial worship service. And a little baby, born in a stable, has come to change the course of history. What a story. Amazing. It kind of takes the sizzle out of the very brave Christmas, doesn't it? It makes you wonder, how can it be that a show about Rudolph or Frosty could hold our interest when the real story is so compelling in itself? It's amazing that people would tune into those other stories about Christmas when the original story has so much to offer. Jesus came into the world as God's gift to mankind. And of course, we know what he came to do, but we forget, don't we? He came to save us from our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow. You know, as I continue to prepare for the message, I discovered that the word for those moving decorations is actually animatronics. Animatronics, that's right, I practiced that all week. It refers to a type of robotic research. And the robots that are produced from this research actually look like lifelike animals and humans. And they appear to come alive, come to life before us. And I found out too that that's the same thing that they use for if you can remember the Chunky Cheese Band, they used to have a, that, that was in Chunky Cheese when I used to take my son there. And um, they're also used at Disney's Country Bear Jamboree and in the Hall of Presidents, where the presidents move their heads and their hands. And I discovered that we have actually been entertained, entertained by these lifelike motions and these machines for years. It's really nothing new, it's just been perfected and transferred into other things like Christmas decorations. And yes, they have become common and they appear in our decorations. From those reindeer that move their head on the lawn and appear to be eating the grass to that life-size Santa that waves and says, ho, ho, ho. Um, and as for those robotic nativity displays, there is one that I, I found out about where a cow or a sheep bobbed their head like a lawn decorated reindeer the same way the cows and the sheep move. And the wise men, they move their arms back and forth, extending the gifts to the baby. Mary and Joseph and the shepherds tilt their heads toward Jesus forward and sometimes they actually twist and bend at the waist and it gives them the appearance of leaning forward to admire and bow a little that they're bowing before this newborn king and worshiping. And one clever designer even created an anim animatronic baby, Jesus, that appears to be breathing in the manger. There with his eyes closed laying among the hay, the torso swells and shrinks just like the inhaling and exhaling of a sleeping baby. And as I thought back on my slightly sarcastic remark about the Santa in the memorial garden, I began to think about how that motion of those robots in the nativity makes that seem more lifelike. It makes the figurines, movements, you know, come to life and, and they actually draw us 
and draw our attention into the scene a little more. And they give us some intimacy when they move like that. And it somehow engages our emotions and invites us to step into that holiest of events for that holy night. It gets our attention for a minute. However, while those animatronics that go on may enhance our appreciation of the scene, we know that those figures are simply representations of the real thing. They, they are just artificial representations of that flesh and blood that took place on that night. They can never replace the real thing. And our celebration of Christmas that will happen later this week um, is about God coming to us in the very real person of Jesus Christ. The baby wrapped in swaddling clothes that lay in that manger was not some kind of robotic, human-like version of a person. He is instead the very real human being. He's just like you and just like me. In today's epistle lesson that we heard, the author of Hebrews is writing what is basically a devotion that is based on Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. And looking at this prayer from the Hebrew prayer book through the lens of life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus, he, he has a prophetic word about Christ that was written long before Christmas. This is an amazing word. In verse 5 and 7, he says, when Christ came into the world, he cited this psalm as referring to himself. <clears throat> and the body you have prepared for me, in verse 5, he's talking about no robotic Jesus here. When you came into the world and into this body that you prepared for me, no robotic Jesus, no fake God. This is no pretend deity. This is the real God, the real Jesus the real Messiah. This is the one who was written about in the scroll, who has come to do God's will. Jesus is the one who God has intended to send all along and who comes to show us the way back to God so we can be restored and renewed with God in a relationship. Powerful stuff. So the author writes that God has made the divine presence known to us in the person of Jesus who came into the world with a body God prepared for him. But this body is not some animatronic body. It's not a robot. For the divine Son of God to appear as a fake human, this human body, a human Jesus, human Jesus, human body, and yet he's the Son of God. The person who walked those streets of Galilee and Jerusalem healing the sick and feeding the hungry was not some kind of human-esque robot programmed and controlled from some remote access point like some kind of a divine drone. He was instead a very real human, human being. He was susceptible to illness. He needed food to survive. He was not dwelling in a robotic body that looked like it was breathing in a manger. He was a real child who needed oxygen just like us. He was a baby who grew as we do into an adult. <clears throat> and he exercised, he got tired, and he needed rest. He was a child who needed his parents to monitor his time on Xbox just like normal kids. He didn't just look like us. He was like us. His body included a mind, a will, and emotions. He was fully, fully human. His body, like ours, was strong, but it was fragile. It was agile, but it was limited. It was caring, but it was also emotionally vulnerable. This baby, this baby born in a stable, is the real, very presence of God. Alive in a very real human being who would later grow up, teach us, heal people, and go to the cross for our sins. He knew our fears as he prayed in the garden for this cup to be taken away from him. He felt the physical pain of the crucifixion and the emotional pain of the loneliness of death. 
for us to say that God was somehow detached from the physical body of Jesus simply does not wash. Jesus Christ did not simply inhabit a body. He was human. The body and Jesus' connection to it were essential to what God was doing through Jesus. He is the real thing. Listen, 1 John 1 in the Living Bible. Christ was alive when the world began, yet I myself have seen him with my own eyes and listened to him speak. Imagine. I have touched him with my own hands. He is God's message of life. <clears throat> this one who is life from God has been shown to us, and we guarantee that we have seen him. I am speaking of Christ, who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then was shown to us. Again, I say we are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may share the fellowship <clears throat> and the joys that we have with the Father and with Jesus Christ, His Son. And if you do as I say in this letter, then you too will be full of joy and so will we. This is the message God has given us to pass on to you. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So if we say we are friends but go on living in spiritual darkness and sin, we are lying. But if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ does, then we have wonderful fellowship and joy with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. What a promise. And if we say that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He can be depended on to forgive us and cleanse us from every wrong. And it is perfectly proper for God to do this for us because Jesus died to wash away our sins. If we claim we have not sinned, we are lying and calling God a liar. For he says, we have sinned. In our readings from Hebrew today, the author emphasizes the point. The point he's making, and he uses the Old Testament sacrificial system as an illustration. Because you see, in the ancient world, the worshipers would place on the altar their best animals from their flocks, sheep and goats and bulls, to be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. And they had to keep coming back and doing that every day. Because they're sinning every day. Psalm 40 cited in today's Hebrew text reminds us that sacrifice was not that all that God desired from us. Instead, God always wanted us to live God's way and to do God's will. That's what it's about. And Jesus' death on the cross was that final sacrifice. Once and for all, he says, through which our sins are forgiven and our relationship with God and his kingdom are restored. That's Christmas. We are called to freely give this gift when we follow Jesus. If you're following his example, we are to give. As Jesus gave his very real body for us, we too are to surrender our will to God. That's the hardest part for so many people. If you want the real thing, if you really, really want the real thing, if you want to understand and enjoy and celebrate Christmas, you can accept no substitutes. At this time of year, we all have relationship offers. Parties, dinners, programs, concerts, all kinds of artificial gatherings. Try to make it a point to seek out real opportunities and real relationships that have potential for sharing love. There's still time, even this week, Visit a nursing home, visit a shut-in, offer to work in a soup kitchen, a homeless shelter. Go out and ring the bell for Salvation Army. You can go caroling to your neighbors. Care for those who have lost loved ones since last Christmas or even this year. Call them, talk to them, hug them. We are representing the real thing. Let's offer the real thing. A relationship with a living loving God. Baby Jesus offers us a relationship in its infancy 
that we get to nurture and grow. If your attitude towards God is, hey, I'll call you when I need you, okay? But I'm all right right now. You're going to miss out on the fullness of the life that Jesus came to give you. You're going to miss it. The fullness of God begins when you have a hunger for God. And Jesus has come to fill that hunger. Are you hungry? Are you? There's an old story about a young man who wanted to be filled with the Spirit of God. So he asked this old sage, <clears throat> an old saint, a man whose life was marked by God's presence, how he, the young man, could experience the same love level of connection with God that this old saint had experienced. And the old man said, if you will walk with me, I will take you to the place where God filled me with his spirit. Because it's the only place on earth where you can receive the fullness of God. The young man said, take me there. The two men began to walk to the streets of the city. Finally, they came to the edge of town. And the young man said, are we close to the place where I can be filled with the power of God? And the old saint said, not yet, just a little further. And they walked through the countryside, and finally they came to the open desert. And the young man asked, are we there yet? Are we close? And the old saint said, not yet, a little further. <coughs> Night had fallen, and the two men set up camp. The next day they continued their journey through the desert. Another day of walking, another night of camping, with the young man asking again and again, are we close to the place where God will fill me with his power? And each time the old saint said, not yet, a little further. After a couple of days' journey, they came to the foot of a mountain, and the young man asked again, is this it? Is this it? Is it on this mountain that God will come to me? And again the old saint said, not yet, a little further. Finally, the young man said, look, I don't care anymore about going to this place that you were talking about. Whether it's a mountain or a valley or a pasture, a valley or a pasture or a desert, I cannot wait any longer. I want the power of God in my life right here, right now. The old man stopped and he said, that's the place. The place you are right now. That's where I was when God first filled me with his spirit. And he will do the same for you. Every day that you take this same spiritual journey and arrive at the same spiritual place, he will fill you with his presence. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's the real thing. During this season, and this is one thing I love about Christmas, we capture a glimpse of the way that life really ought to be, the way that life could be if we would only just let it be. During this season, we're reminded of the kind of life that God had planned for us and for people everywhere. We're confronted with the reality that we are nowhere near the standard, nowhere near what it ought to be. There's something about this season that just seems to make it so much more real, so, so much closer than any other time of year that we need a Savior. It comes real. We need a Savior. You can't answer for the rest of the world, but you can answer for yourself. You can experience the fullness of God's greatest gift, Jesus, every day of your life. How does it begin? It begins when you realize how real this gift is. And then you reach out and you take the gift. Those who are ready to recognize their need for God, who are ready to put away their pride and come to Him in humility, those who are ready to abandon their self-satisfaction, people who are hungry for God's presence in their lives, those who are ready ready to admit that they don't have it all together and they never will, that they are lost without Jesus. These, these are the ones whose lives will be filled with good things from above. He came to fill those who are hungry for the presence of God. 
That is the real thing. And there is nothing else like the real thing. As we gaze upon the nativity scenes in these final days before Christmas, perhaps now we'll remember that the baby in the manger was a really very real human, just like us. He loved and he was loved. He celebrated and laughed. He was energetic at times, hungry and tired at other times. He knew joy and celebration just like us, and he felt that pain and loneliness. This past summer, you know, in this animatronics, there was a thing that the nation put on that, uh, for engineers and Purdue participated in. It's uh, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, and it was a robotics challenge where the best engineers from around the world came together and to create robots that could perform a series of skills and mimic human behavior. And it was for the Department of Defense actually for when there was a bomb scare or something to be able to climb ladders and detect and deactivate these things. And the first prize was $2 million. As amazing as these robots were though, sometimes things didn't go as well as planned. They tipped over, they fell over, arms fell off, things fell apart and they actually fell down and bumped into each other and they made a movie about it and they put it to like Keystone Cops piano music, da 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 boop, you know, and that kind of thing. Gil Pratt, who's the organizer of the robotics challenge, he said he was somewhat surprised by the reactions of the spectators of the competition. These robots are big and made of lots of metal and you might think people seeing them would be filled with fear and anxiety. But that wasn't how people responded. Instead, the human spectators seemed to connect emotionally with the robots. They were cheering them on and they would cheer on the team. We heard groans of sympathy when the robots fell. Pratt continued and, and he said, and what, pe and, and what did people do every time the robot scored a point? They cheered and they applauded. They were involved with these robots. It was an extraordinary thing, he said. And we get that, don't we? Huh? Many people going to Disney get connected to their favorite animated characters. We ooh and ah over the cuteness of those robotic reindeer or that waving Santa. We may even be drawn more intimately into a nativity scene where all the characters are leaning forward to worship the baby Jesus, who through the magic of animatronics appears to be breathing in that manger. This, though, that's not the Christmas story. Jesus is not some human-like form of God, but a real human baby. This is the miracle of Christmas. Here's the miracle, the omnipotent God of the universe, who is beyond space and time, chose to empty himself and come to us in the form of a human being. Out of his great love for you and me, he comes as a baby, born into poverty on that night in Bethlehem. There in the manger, there in the manger lies our God, who will surrender his body, his very life, for your sake and mine. The one Mary holds and nurses the one who cannot talk or walk or even hold up his head. The one who will need his diaper changed is God in the flesh, come to make us holy. One day soon, when he is grown, this very real human being will choose to be totally obedient to God. Even when it means giving up his very real body to be crucified. Through this painful sacrifice, we are made whole. God has given us all the gift of Jesus. And that, my friends, is the only gift we need. Because in him we have everything. This Christmas, it is my prayer for all of us that we will receive the gift that truly keeps on giving. And that we will open up this gift every single day so that we can celebrate his presence, his experience, and his power in our lives. Because that's the real thing. 
Christmas is not some cute robotic scene. This is very real. This is love. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love this Christmas. We know that we get caught up in decorations and celebrations. Help us not to miss the point that our lives and the lives of others may be changed. Lord, we pray that the world will be changed and so often we expect you to do it. And Lord, we know that you want to, but it's through us. It's through us that you want to do it. Give us faith and strength and courage to step up. And when we say, Lord, use us to use for your glory, may we do so. Do with us what you will to change this world, Lord. Make us not be complainers, but people who are active. Active in making a difference in this world, that this Christmas can make a difference in many lives, Lord. We thank you for the very real presence 